Thank you so much, Professor Raja Mohan. For uh, Professor, for uh, saying something that uh, we've been saying for. Can you hear me? Okay. And that is uh, for the Lucist policy to be successful, it cannot bypass East and North East. So it has to go through this region. And for us to build connectivities with either Myanmar or Thailand or, you know, this part or, or even Nepal. Uh, Calcutta has to play a very central role. Um, so now um, I will go over to Professor Hari Vasudevan, uh, our own in-house expert on these issues. So Professor Vasudevan. <laughs> Hold the mic up. <laughs> ago when I used to uh, talk about, uh, no, 15 odd years ago, when I used to talk about <laughs> geopolitics with, um, with Raja Mohan, he used to talk about a foreign policy for Calcutta. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to notice that that particular uh, theme in his mind has never entirely receded. So. Uh, something that has to be done out of the city uh, is still a preoccupation with them and the idea of actually doing things around the city, around the region is something which has been running through his mind uh, over many, many years now. It's a decade and a half at least that he's been throwing this idea around and I think it has been thrown around frequently by you in the city. Um, so it's... Uh, uh, it's, he's attempted to, to draw people into the debate. Um, I, uh, I, I, I'm not meant to, to, to really, uh, uh, to just pose questions. On the other hand, I'm not simply meant to sum up either. So what I shall do is a little bit of both, uh, and, um, try and open, uh, your, uh, minds to perhaps some questions that we can uh, put to uh, to Raja um, in order to to make this uh, this presentation of his which is already um, fairly uh, extremely broad ranging um, both more exciting and more more challenging perhaps in fact the last bit especially because after all we uh, all of us are somewhere concerned with um, improving the quality of the way in which we deal with our own region and, and our own city and, and where its future will go. Um, Raja essentially deals with about five separate sections in this presentation, um, of which uh, he, the, the kickoff really is, uh, is to point out in uh, the first two, uh, the first one really, one and a half, that once upon a time, India thought of itself as part of a much broader world. And that uh, the links which actually bound India to that broader world were tangible, physical, commercial links which are associated with shipping, with uh, uh, commerce, uh, with networks, which actually took us well into Southeast Asia into the far, into West Asia and beyond. That uh, within that framework um, we drew, we grew, uh, and that finally during the course of the post-partition, uh, the post-independence era, uh, we decided to remove ourselves from that space. The actual links and connections which tied us to the broader world could have been self-generated, could have been generated from outside. Uh, he leaves these questions reasonably open. So, for instance, partly trading empires that were associated with Muslim networks that were operating from Southeast Asia, from West Asia, were responsible for this globalization. Partially Buddhist and other networks before that. Partially the British Empire, which was in sync with a number of these networks as well as new networks that were set up during this period. From within that, India decided to put a halt to many of these links and connections and became much more introverted. 
within this scenario uh, we have uh, two major developments and really he gives a section to each of these the first in an explosive manner he presents is the movement of China into a large global space and the challenge that it presents on our uh, borders so not only as far as the economy is concerned but as far as security is concerned a challenge in many different ways I mean it's a challenge about a way of life in in in, in his eyes uh, the this particular arrival happens to coincide with a series of global changes which are associated with Washington consensus end of the uh, the disintegration of the USSR etc etc uh, all of which uh, require that India adapts uh, to uh, a new world in a new manner a part of which or part of which challenge India refuses to do or is reluctant to do primarily because of the social challenges as well as the strategic challenges that um, the Chinese economy for instance uh, tends to pose when issues of connectivity issues of links in the South Asian region and its broader neighborhood are actually posed so in this quandary um, it's a quandary only up to a certain point because all the changes of the 90s and the 2000s have required an opening up have required a going out have brought an end to the contraction of the mid-century uh, but the quandary which is placed before India is then to be resolved in a piecemeal manner none of the challenges that China poses can simply be wished away as Raja points out essentially uh, when you actually have uh, developmental schemes you have strategic uh, strategic initiatives which piggyback on these um, witness the uh, presence of the nuclear submarine in Karachi etc etc uh, the challenges are real but the idea is not to run away from the challenges but to engage with them and within a global matrix attempt somewhere to build up your own resources to move forward and to look east but to look east in a positive manner which actually takes into consideration the growth economies of some of the eastern territories throughout the whole of the presentation uh, what Raja tries to point out is that space is not necessarily defined by geography but that space is defined by a larger sense of connection transport uh, communications all of which have a particular rhythm of their own uh, they don't immediately just depend on railways but they depend on railway policy they um, it is possible to think in terms of larger connections with the United States United Kingdom uh, Europe etc quite clearly within such a framework because essentially we're dealing with global economies and what you need to do is to open your ports your airports etc to a series of these links which are global in character so this issue of connection is very important to the way in which the uh, presentation is made and that is where the image of the new silk routes actually comes into the picture because essentially the silk routes were to were to do with connectivities and their refurbishment the way in which they've been reworked in a global environment this is quite clearly um, the way in which they have taken on a new avatar uh, a new uh, focus partly given to them by the Americans after the disintegration of the USSR partially given to them by the Chinese in way of both uh, accepting the challenge of what the Americans provided and also in uh, developing their own answer to it in the one belt one road formulation so this large uh, presentation uh, then leaves us with this uh, way of looking forward uh, a low way of looking forward where as he says you must know where you came from you came from a global environment uh, you reduced yourself and you are going back into a global environment 
and the terms of your entry into that global environment are what you must now negotiate. Uh, now, I would like uh, just to, to pose uh, some straightforward, I think that's a fair resume uh, of the way in which you've handled it. Um, I just have two or three, um, I think, um, fairly simple observations uh, to make. Uh, first and foremost, I think, uh, uh, I uh, would like uh, to, um, to, to point out that the, it, it's always nice to simplify the history in order to, uh, as it were, to go back to origin. So the notion of our origin being global, our uh, contraction being uh, uh, post-originary, uh, and therefore going back to basics being a solution, uh, I'm not quite certain entirely will hold water uh, in the sense that uh, the way in which you've presented it, that itself is the source of the question. Frequently, India's globality was created by others. It was not created by forces that were generated within the subcontinent itself. The subcontinent actually frequently, as my friend Bhaskar Chakravarti occasionally used to say, preferred to survive on the land rather than be drowned at sea. So it was very seldom that uh, Indians would, with the exception of our good friend the Cholas, uh, look east in a dynamic manner. Uh, there are a number of communities which were willing to to dare the great connectivities of the sea, but they were few in nature. Um, and they normally existed in time specific periods and by and large they tended to be coastal in their direction rather than open sea. Most of the large Indian Ocean voyages were handled by Arab seafarers. Um, the Southeast Asian directions tended to be moved mostly um, by coastal uh, movement with, as I said once again, the exception of the Cholas, who were very unusual uh, seafarers. This, as far as we can see, is the way in which historical evidence uh, lies with us. Most of our activity tended to be internal. I leave this as a historical problem. This is not something for debate, uh, and I don't expect you to take this on because this is the kind of problem which we can debate ad infinitum. There are those who will say yes, there are those who will say no. So please just take it from me that it's a comment that I'm making for, uh, a, as a challenge to you to read more and to me to actually think a bit more about the subject rather than dealing with Raja's paper in, 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 uh, in essence. But I think the what's important is to realize that the jury is still out on how far the internal dynamics of India are by nature global in orientation. India may be very attractive to others, others may come here, others may take things. India may be involved by others in a global economy but that India should by itself, by nature, be naturally external looking. The jury is out on that in many ways. This is my, my historical comment. Second is a minor historical question, rather, and you don't have to answer the first comment, but is a question. What is it that actually led to the contraction? Can you simply wish away the forces which led to the contraction? Was the nature of the contraction entirely anti-global in character? For instance, the entire Nehruvian economy ultimately existed on the basis of a series of networks through which its inefficiencies could be corrected within a global space. Whether it be traders in London during the 1960s, 70s and 80s, whether it be traders in the Far East during the same period, whether it be those who were in West Asia and in East Africa, all of whom handled what we call today informal financial systems, that is, either the Hundi, Hawala, other such financial, informal financial arrangements, India in 
uh, strict sense has never, even in its highest period of contraction, entirely been anti-global. It has required the global scenario in order to develop even its contracted space. Now, since this peculiar relationship came to exist between the two, is it easy to wish away the institutions that have grown up around both, i.e. the nature of contraction and the nature of the spaces as well as the institutions on which it was bound? There are some cases where we can see the way in which, say, Mauritius is used or the way in which other places in which informal arrangements are used, even today to back up the nature of India's globalization. I would pose a problem here for you, which comes from a recent past, which is that you cannot simply say that the contraction period is over. Its challenges are real, and it requires to be understood and half the issue which pertains to the so-called reforms and to the globalization actually comes from the persistence of the institutions, the attitudes, as well as the connections of that era. It also comes from why the era was set up in the first place. That is, it comes from the notion of a developmentalist in a strict and narrow focus sense, as opposed to a commercial as well as an outward-looking, inegalitarian system of economy building and society building. There, is a, there are two attitudes here, and even today in much of our national life, inequality is practically inbuilt into our reform processes and it is never approached and when it is approached there is a continuous attempt somewhere to say no we are certainly not against the notion of egalitarianism or building an equal society that particular position which the chinese have increasingly come to accept which is that an egalitarian society is a route to a communist future that and that inequality is important in order to ensure growth which however must be undertaken within certain narrow boundaries uh, that inequality uh, and its acceptance that particular notion has not become part of our national life in the rhetoric of national life it is part of the reality of national life in terms of the way in which national life exists but it is not part of what any government will ever accept in this country. So this is a major problem. I mean, when you are dealing with the reconnection in the way in which you are, the focus of that reconnection is continuously going to be challenged by this particular problem. The second thing I would like to, to raise is uh, the issue of uh, how you have suggested that the engagement should take place. My own position would be that um, the recreation of the Silk Roots after 1991 as an image, as a format of thought, essentially came to us from the West. Uh, it is part, as you said, of the disintegration process after the Soviet Union fell to pieces and essentially those who were using it were primarily American and European in terms of their orientation and extraction. The Chinese turned this particular system on its head very much as they turned the system of connectivity on its head. If you go back to 1914, Raja, you will notice that the railway runs from Beijing to Bonn and beyond. So actually, in 1914, you could have traveled all the way from London, in fact, after you cross on the ferry and finally landed up in Beijing. Okay, I can show you the handbooks that show. No, no, before the Soviet Union, all right? That is, with the connections that were made between 1897 and 1900 of the Trans-Siberian Railway and the creation of the Chinese Manchurian Railway, the connectivity was already in place, okay? What happened is that goods flowed 
west to east. The Chinese have turned this thing on its head, which is that now they wish to ensure that that connectivity drive is east to west. That is that they will use these networks for their benefit rather than the benefits that the Russians and the Europeans gain from this particular set of connections in the early part of the 20th century. This is a, that's why I said the globalization of the 90s was essentially an attempt by the United States and others to reset the balance in a pre, to a pre-Soviet era. The Chinese used the environment in order to set a new set of terms for themselves in which they, as the workshop of the world, would utilize the space given by the United States and Europe, and they have been successful. But why is it that India should buy into a Chinese dream, an American dream, or into a European dream? The Chinese have repeatedly been setting new terms in the way in which they define the use of law, the use of tariffs, the use of currencies all around. They are both protective as well as non-protective. They are both externally oriented investment, at the same time protected, protective as far as investment is concerned. They use international law to their own specific aims, Why with their own specific... Why is this is, this, no, 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 wait. No, 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 what I'm saying... No, uh, my question to you, my question to you is, why should we not actually create our own rules of the game? That's what? No, no. Wait, wait. Have the road between Dhaka and Calcutta running? What I'm, I'm talking about, they're not dominating the whole world. All I'm saying, build a damn road between Lahore and Amritsar, which is shut down. That doesn't require dealing with the world hegemony. It doesn't require to run a road between a transit through East Bengal. It doesn't mean changing the global order. I'm saying it's your policies have fundamentally reduced your connectivity to regions that were once part of your own territory. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. So I'm not trying to argue look about all the past and how we reconstruct. I'm saying lay the damn roads. It's not rocket science. No, no, I said it's your policies yeah, well, actively yeah. discourage yeah. I'm glad I'm tea with your own neighbors. Yeah. I get the rest of the world. No, 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 I am yeah, no, no, I I hurry to finish it. No, no, I'm not I I am not actually I said my first comment I would rather you did not approach. When you say okay. something, yeah. you ask me for a response. No, 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 the first the first issue as I said is uh a counterfactual, completely look. I am not really no, no. All right. I'm saying is, look. No, no, Raja, let me, let me, let me just, let me, let me just take this. Let me just go this. Yeah. My own sense is that you have an answer. So please, let me, let me finish. No, no, no. My, no. I said, no. I said your paper has an answer. Your paper is, your paper's answer is that our response to the Chinese should be regional in character, i.e. It's this reconnection of the subcontinent, okay? And its immediate neighborhood. But you don't get it. Now, this but... Because you don't talk here, you disconnect it, right? So you don't connect your own internal territory. Forget the Chinese. I mean, no, but it, we're, we're dealing with the subcontinent yeah. ultimately. Yeah. Okay, from Afghanistan through to Myanmar and... I mean, that's roughly the subcontinent. Yeah. 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 railway line, 1893, we talked about a railway line in the Kashmir. You still don't connect. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I can answer you on why we don't have, that doesn't matter. Um, I've been studying your Waziristan and things like that recently. But anyway, I won't go into the history of this thing. Um, I, my own sense though, uh, despite what you said about the region, and I, I, to be frank with you, I've been observing this when we're dealing with Kunming and with, um, with, uh, with Myanmar. You know, I'm not certain given the challenge that is being posed to, uh, to our economy today in a global space, that a regional answer is sufficient. Um, my own sense is that, and uh, my own sense is that the Modi government is far-sighted in, a, in the sense that it understands that the regional answer is not sufficient that somewhere it has to build on spaces which are transnational and global in nature. And it is because of that that I am just a bit 
uh, reluctant entirely to accept the necessity just for a regional solution to what I think today India faces as a global problem. Um, as a, so my, prob my poser to you is twofold. Firstly, will the shadow of the past so easily go away? And is it actually totally and completely an irrational contraction that was once there? Secondly, if we build our region, is the income even of this region, in the way in which it exists, adequate to solve our problems? If you look at the way in which, for instance, the Chinese handle Myanmar, this is a standard loot policy, which is you set up the road, you enter the country, you remove the resources, and you give nothing in exchange. All right? This is to build the main Chinese economy. It's not actually to build a larger market. The reason is very simple, which is the infrastructure and the institutions to make that market and to create it as a dynamic force in the future of your own economy is yet to be laid. And you, because of your own developmental failures, do not have the wherewithal or the capacity to actually create those alternatives on the other side. The Chinese answer is, just take what you want and get out. In the Indian case, we don't even have the wherewithal to be able to do that. So my poser is, is the regional answer sufficient? When you're dealing with new silk routes, surely you should actually pose this as global routes of communication rather than as silk routes. Ultimately, I'd say the term silk route is still something which India does not have a serious investment in. I'd say we have to think much more broadly because the two major gainers from that particular image are Chinese or Americans, as the case may be. Thank you so much, I'm sure. Sure. I'm not going to, <laughs> now to respond to the commentary on my 45-minute talk, so that's going to take uh, the whole bit. Yeah, you did for 30 minutes. Or to talk for 45 minutes, but I think uh, I'm not going to do that. But I just want to make three points. Look, you exactly go on a track. I said that's not interest me. I'm not here to say whether what we did in, in the past was right or wrong. I'm just identifying two, three phases in your revolution. I'm not saying Nehru was good or bad. I'm saying that you took a, so that was not simplification. That there was a set of economic policies that British India had. There's a set of policies Nehruvian India had. There's a different set of policies since 1991. I mean, that is a straightforward division of contemporary history. Now, the change in economic orientation, I'm saying, takes you in a different direction. That's all I'm saying. So, the, so I'm not here to second guess what was good or what was right, what was wrong. This is broadly a macro division of what contemporary India has gone through. So therefore, uh, it is irrelevant for me that it, to question your this a heritage historian's job to study that, and not to say whether that is contemporary politics. I'm not interested in that whether that was right or wrong. The second point you make was that inevitable or not? Look, it, is it, does it really matter today that you took certain steps, you, certain orientation in 47 to 52, which reduced the value of trade? Right? You are not interested in trade. Therefore, you're not interested in expanding your connectivity. That did, did that mean there was no internationalism to Nehru? Of course, Nehru was a great internationalist. You met your fellow third world countries in New York, in Manhattan, bullshitting on UN resolutions, rather than doing, meeting them with the region and trading with them. That's what you did. You met them today in the non-aligned summits in G77, resounding what you, exactly what you said. Let's change the global order first. That we cannot develop without changing the global order. That was the argument that you're posing today. The new international economic order was a, was a claim that we are fundamentally doomed and that the only way we can grow if we change the terms of the power distribution in the international system. What the East Asians have shown you was actually they can grow under the existing rules. And they've outdone the Western countries today. And that's where the struggle today, the second thoughts on globalization today, are coming from the United States. That's where Mr. Trump comes from. 
What's happened today in Brexit is probably part of that. So therefore, the question is, was it inevitable or was it the only way? That is not what interests me. What interests me is that why is it that India does not trade with Pakistan? Why is it that India's trade with Bangladesh is so low? Why is it that we did not build railway lines in our own border areas? When Tinsutia Mail goes back to 1893, on the first plans to build a railway line to Kashmir when, in the 19th century, why is it that you did not do? Because there was a conscious strategic policy which said, I must keep my frontiers underdeveloped because somebody else will walk into that. That was the conscious strategy of the Indian state. I'm saying you've got to change that today. So three levels at which you've got to change. One, internal connectivity. This doesn't trade. You're talking about, you know, is it sufficient? I'm saying it is necessary. That's all I'm saying. I'm saying having roads that take you to Leh, Ladakh, that your railway line that runs across your own damn territory is a necessary condition for integration of your own state. Which is what the Chinese have done in the last 30 years. After having shut down Tibet, shut down Xinjiang, that today they've connected those regions. That was what the West region strategy was about. So all I am saying is the first step is to connect your own country. I mean, it goes back to Sher Sah Suri. I mean, every single IR theory tells you connecting your own markets, connecting your own states, building roads is not a genius statecraft. That is a central part. But you took a conscious decision not to do it for whatever reason, right or wrong. Question is, have we been able to correct it in the last 25 years? The policy in the last 20 years has been, we will push back our railways to a border areas. That's one part. Second part is how to be connected to the neighboring countries there with Pakistan, it's complicated by political problems. With Bangladesh, a whole range of different problems. But today, in the last 10 years, you've seen some improvement in the East. So all I'm saying, there is a huge potential in the East. If you build on that, there is more to be done in the East of the subcontinent. Third, have we overcome the problem, the resistance to globalization? Of course not. You see, Mr. Subramanian Swami, what has he done last few days? Mr. Modi goes everywhere, meets NRI, and says, guys, come home, help the country develop. Here is the great symbol of that NRI community. Running your reserve bank, you say, he's not Indian. That's what Mr. Swami says, and he's that way. So that struggle will go on. I mean, I think, where is that struggle going to finish? Or are you going to wait till the struggle finishes? I'm saying... The nature of your economy has changed. When Rajiv Gandhi died, your total two-way trade was $40 billion. 1980, Rajiv Gandhi stepped down in 1989. Today it is $750 billion of trade in goods and commodities. Another, throw in another 100 on services. That's your trade. Out of a $2.4 trillion, close to a trillion dollars is your trade. Now that is a new condition of the Indian economy. That condition requires both expanding your regional connectivity and international connectivity. And some of the international connectivity has come in through the NRIs, through the linkages that you have today. If somebody from my home state, good Andhra engineer is killed in, say, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, my chief minister picks up the phone and asks the foreign minister, what the hell are you doing about it? Six Malayali nurses in Kuwait or wherever it is in Iraq, so today, people are demanding that Indian state do more for its people abroad. So they're under pressure to do more things. So I don't see the struggle for that is it a conscious, happy globalization? No. There's no difference between CPM and the, and the RSS when it comes to certain things. Right. A left secular argument against globalization is equally strongly reflected on the right, who say, don't do, we still might go back to the East India Company. Don't do GM crops. Don't do this. Don't do that. So you hear a lot of that too. So that struggle is going on, but the fact is that struggle is taking place in a more complex environment where your economy has become dependent. Therefore, I think the challenges are, are, are complex. So I would say, look, past is never past, as you know. And that the evil, but the nature, some parts of our past have changed. The economic orientation has changed. The emphasis on connectivity has changed, but your implementation has not improved. Therefore, I would say, all I'm saying is, there are small things you can do on your own territory, in your neighborhood, and if there are connectivity projects that can be built, I would say engage the Chinese, engage the Japanese, engage the Americans, whoever it is who can do roads, 
connectivity in your neighborhood. That's all the proposition here is that connectivity has become a necessity for your economic prosperity and that overcoming some of the tragedies of partition must necessarily involve reconnecting this Punjab and Bengal to your status. So, so that is the proposition. One is not going back to contest history, but each one of these propositions involves significant devotion of energy and the policy coherence to make that happen. That's all the proposition. Thank you so much. Now we will take three or four questions maximum from the floor and short questions, please. I am Devashis Das. I am a student of IFPS, Calcutta University. Uh, my question is to Mohan, sir. In a very lighter way, you have uh, mentioned the problem of Pakistan. Uh, you have uh, very elaborately discussed about Chinese influence and uh, their development. But the thing is that uh, we are facing more trouble, more problematic situation than Chinese do. Even around the world, you are just forgetting about the part of terrorism. We see every now and then blasts in our country. Let there be someone who, who blows some bridges in uh, Beijing, coming all the way from Xinjiang. And then let's see whether China can develop that or not. When we talk about infrastructure development, because we are facing an area where our investments, our money, goes to defense development more than any other infrastructure development. Because we have to think that any blast, any 9-11 does not happen once again. So how do you think on the back of I mean, you can see, today it's a, it's a historic day. European Union just crashed. We got your question. We got your question. So on the back of this particular thing, how do you think this building roads, I mean, this silk road or any other over, can sustain for a long time and it will indeed give a better future for the subcontinent. Devishish, thank you. We've got your question. Um, yeah, there. Nirmal Babu. We had been talking about trans and connectivity and about Buddhism, how it promoted it. Then you talked about the British uh, initiatives and all that. My question is now, what the British did, the British initiative, British activities in, uh, in Sikkim, in Tibet, in British interest in Nepal, possibly that is what alerted the Chinese and they started taking an active interest in Tibet. And that is what started the rivalry between, military rivalry between India and China which has disrupted the entire connectivity in the Himalayan region and divided this region. So my question is these imperious activities, even, even today you look at the United States. The United States is trying to uh, promote um, connectivity. They are present in Myanmar, but in the name of uh, searching for their uh, this uh, Second World War uh, crashes, they are uh, uh, planting listening devices on the border. So whether these activities, imperialist activities in the past, or in, even in the present, this has rather helped uh, connectivity or it has disrupted connectivity and standing in the way of uh, reconnecting this part of the subcontinent. Um, Shubir? The forces against connectivity, one of the important forces is the defense lobby. You alluded to it when you said there were people who didn't want the railway line to go up to the last mile. This is the defense people who said that, you know, if the area is underdeveloped, the Chinese can't just walk in. The point is that this lobby in a new incarnation is again creating a huge problem for Sino-Indian relations because they want a stronger military, they want military expansion and by default, therefore, they have a vested interest in conflict with China rather than collaboration and cooperation with China. Because then you get to buy more American weapons and the Americans love that. They, they replace Russia as number one weapon supplier for India. The point I'm trying to make here is, you have said and you're right, I agree with your entire exposition that we should deal with the Chinese. We are all for it. We are in the K2K, Hari, for Jointa Babu, we are all. But the point I'm trying to make here is that there is this very strong lobby and I'm not just talking about some 
Subramaniam Swami or somebody like that. I'm talking of the very well entrenched defense lobby, defense contractors, arms dealers, generals, you know, raw people who vanish uh, in CIA hands. Three of them are gone this year. Very strong lobby which promotes conflict with China. General Padmanabhan writing about a Sino Indian water war in 2029, predicting the next. War in China is a cottage industry now. Somebody said 2012. You know, this whole industry operates, this whole nexus operates in a very devious way. Foreclosing possibilities, even limited cooperation or limited dealing with China. How do you, what's your take on this? Last question, anybody? Okay, if there isn't, if there is one, okay. Last question. Last question. I am Shahin Dabadan. I am from CSIRD. My question is the India development uh, cotton route against Silk Road and its development in uh, Iran Chabahar port and uh, this Abadis, Bangladesh, Mongla and Paira port. So how to re reconnect in the uh, subcontinent in uh, Silk Road in, uh, with India? Okay. One last question there. Thank you, Professor um, Rajamohan, for your for sharing your views. I'd like to invoke the point that given the incidence of growing trade and economic relations and the increasing tendency towards complex interdependence and the emergence of geoeconomics, do you find that geo geopolitics acts as a hindrance in the path of growing trade networks and in realizing the paradigm of geoeconomics? Thank you. Now over to Professor Rajamohan. The emphasis on infrastructure investments is fairly recent, right? I think, as I said, uh, through the 47 to until now, in fact, you've seen, for example, on the railways, how limited the focus on expanding the Indian railways has been. I think after independence, we barely added, what, uh, 10,000, 11,000 you know, kilometers of, of railway to the 60,000 odd that were inherited, while the Chinese had inherited, the Chinese had barely 10, 11,000 uh, in 1949, they've crossed now 110,000 kilometers of length uh, in, in, in China. Uh, we're not even talking about high-speed railways, we're talking about the, the normal railway system. So I think, look, that integrating your own internal markets and your turbulent frontier areas, that was neglected through the last 70 years and that today in the last 10 years there has been talk, there is some investment, but the implementation there has been problems. While there are political issues in each of the frontier areas, whether it is Kashmir, whether it is today even in Punjab or within the East, the question of straightforward statecraft that you need to do more to integrate these regions. That, that doesn't read, I mean it doesn't need such a complicated structure I and mean, I think that is we've largely neglected that task today we're talking about it therefore linking your own markets today of uh, in, in, in your own country we're not even talking about Bangladesh and Pakistan that that is the first step and I think doing that today is has become uh, recognized at least as a as a worthwhile policy objective and that's what's happening but in terms of political stabilization that is a whole range of issues while the Chinese today a far better control of their frontier areas, but they also have problems of a kind that we are not very dissimilar to ours, but overall they are in better control. But today you might say that, look, you have, there is more turbulence in Kashmir, but there is some kind of a process that unfolds, was it good or bad, that's a different set, but that's not my subject for today's exploration. That integrating your own territory has become has gotten new attention and that gets, in fact, becomes even more urgent when you're talking about connectivity across uh, your, your neighboring regions and I think that's, that is the point that was being made. The second point, I think, uh, uh, in terms of the issues that are raised, look, there will be politics of all kinds that, that goes on. The question is, is the state capable of doing some of the minimal functions? If you walk to the Nepal border, see some, you know, you go to Raksal, you see the road between Nepal and India. You see the nature of your customs station. 
you see the nature of your land border out there. It's pathetic. I mean, this doesn't, you know, you don't need to compare it into all kinds of grand theories of uh, ultra theorizing. You just walk, see, go to Raksaul border, busy, one of the busiest crossings between India and Nepal, which you had a free trade agreement with that country. See the state of the border. What pathetic state? I mean, you go to Lumbini and the uh, Northern Wa, it's a, Northern Wa is on our side, Lumbini is on the other side, Buddha was born there, are probably one of the greatest points in the world. There's not much to be seen there, but here is the site. You've got to locate what is the symbol of Indian state, right? Any state, customs station is the classic symbol of the sovereign territory begins here. And an immigration guy who says, okay, show me your papers, right? You go see, you got to go to find out where your custom station is. I mean, nobody, you don't need Chinese being bad guys, Americans being thugs or, look, none of them have stopped you from running your own establishment, right? So I think we can blame the entire world outside, but what is the quality of your state institutions? You might have the third largest military, but you walk to the Nepal boundary, where you have such a pathetic state of basic infrastructure and the police, the range of police structures you put in there actually harasses people who cross the boundary because the Nepalese are taking home what they earned in this country. I mean, these are not about international politics. This is about minimal administration that you need to do for yourself. But in the name of a grand theorizing, in the name of building, in the name of fighting the poor, in the name of equality, you neglected the core functions of a state. And I think the challenge of connectivity is essentially in relation to that. That minimal functions of a state, of guarding your frontiers, of exercising sovereignty, and having the capacity to regulate normal trade, limit illegal trade, those are the normal functions of a state. This nobody is stopping, the Chinese are not stopping you from building roads in your own country. So the question is, look, have we devoted enough attention to that? That is the big question. The, the other thing, in terms of the, look, the military policy, look, you can't blame the military for it. Look, I mean, after all, civilians are in charge in this country. The military has been removed from all policy making since independence, since in the beginning of independence. They don't make the policy on Silk Road. I mean, you want to build trade with the Chinese. I mean, you are trading today. They are your largest trading partner. No, 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 that's a, no, 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 no. The, that's all there is. Look, there are, it is sections. Yes. There are different sections. Finally, it is the political leadership that has to resolve your internal disputes. That it is today less the military, that it is on the civilian parts of our system, which I still can't figure out how do you deal with the Chinese economic power. You're right on, for example, on the visas. Prime Minister Modi has to fight with the IB and the RAW to say we will liberalize visas for the Chinese. Okay, we don't like the Chinese, the second largest economy, is that the way you want to deal with the visa question with the Chinese? So some of these need minimal reforms, so this is not requiring a fundamental change. I mean, I think in border administration, border management, building connectivity, these are fairly minimal tasks that we've neglected, and I think doing even a slight improvement in that will produce dividends, and of course, which will also require resolving some of the boundary disputes that you have. Or, I always wonder, uh, yeah, but, I always wonder if I can then just say, well, then, why no, India, see, Indian I border road can build a trans border road, but they can't build a uh, transport road. We cannot have follow-up follow questions. We will have tea. At that time, you can ask follow-up questions. So, the last question on, on, the, on the geopolitics. Look, I think we have neglected economics. I mean, there was a grand state building activity of self-reliance, socialism, building public sector, all that stuff. Uh, but the on when it comes to trade, because trade was seen as a, as a negative dimension, that a self-reliant economy doesn't need much trade. Therefore, and that, okay, you apply that to the West, there's one logic to it. Apply to your neighbors, there's another logic. That today, you ask the Nepalese, you ask the Pakistanis, you ask any one of our neighbors, all the rhetoric of India and the UN talking about the protectionism of the markets of the Western countries, you just replace the West, put India as there, that's what applies to them. Uh, India is one of the most difficult markets to trade with. Whether it is non-tariff barriers are so high, 
you go to Colombo, you go to Kathmandu, you go to Dhaka, all they're talking about is NTBs. Now we've said, look, we removed all the normal barriers, at least for the LDCs, but the NTBs. So I'm not saying they're entirely right, but there are problems in the way we've thought about our borders, our trading across the borders, our relationship. So if you want to call that geoeconomics, I have no problem. But elementary aspects of trading with your neighbors, of creating structures of how do you regulate your borders is, is the problem and I think there any connectivity for example would significant, would demand a, a, a fundamental reform of border management. Uh, for example, uh, how do you let the good, good guys go through, legitimate guys and stop the other guys uh, from coming in that requires, look, for example today the border with Pakistan is completely militarized. Those of you have seen the new Uttar Hai Punjab, you see the first shot where the drug is being thrown across, I mean, where you corrupt, the whole system gets corrupted through drug trade. Uh, you have a completely open border with Nepal, where there are different set of problems. With Bangladesh, you have an anarchic border. Every day our Home Minister says, I'm going to fence it, as if that's going to solve your problems. You go to Assam, there are whole questions of migration. So you have inherited, because, again, because of, largely because of partition and the economic policies that you pursued, extraordinary difficulties in what was this a single integrated space 70 years ago. So addressing this is far more consequential than all the grandstanding about changing the terms of global trade, uh, altering the West versus East equations, North versus the South equations. This is within your agency a large part of it. Can be managed if you fundamentally alter some of the approaches. But take the beef trade, I mean you have Oh, minister talks about, I'll ban all beef trade, right? I'll starve the Bangladeshis of beef. I mean, here is a cow belt and there is a beef belt. There is demand, there is supply. And you want to put yourself in the middle of it and saying, I'll put a fence, I'll stop the beef from going across this. Now, is that an enlightened policy or is it a crazy? And much of the problems on the India-Bangla border, a large part of it on this side, that is Bengal side, takes place largely because of the cattle smuggling. Are you willing to deal with it honestly? No. There is your ideology or religion, we put everything into it. I think those are the problems. I mean, this is not super duper stuff. This is management of your own uh, territories around you uh, with a reasonable basis. And within that, there is a Chinese strategic complex today that is emerging. Uh, how do you deal with that? So that again, I think there are places, I said, where you can collaborate with them. There are places where we need to find alternatives with the Japanese, with Americans, whoever is willing to do. In some places, by sheer local collaboration, that you can do things on your own. You can build some projects in Bangladesh. There are things that we can do. That is what, when you talk about geoeconomics in a narrow sense. But the Chinese is the number two economy. They're going to bring a whole range of things into play. And I think dealing with them requires, firstly, engaging the problem in the first place and not saying, because I have a border dispute with the Chinese, or the Chinese are not going to let me enter the nuclear club. I'm going to do something else. I think there you need a far more differentiated uh, approach of dealing with the Chinese power. Thank you so much, Professor Raja Mohan. Um, years back, we tried to begin a sub-regional dialogue with Nepal and Bangladesh. This is one of the main planks of connectivity is knowledge connectivity. So we completely failed because there was no support from the central government, nothing. So I hope uh, ideas are changing. And I think, uh, you know, one can think of it as a national response. One can think of it as a sub-regional response. But response there has to be because the, the Chinese issue, I wouldn't say it to be a problem, is out there. Our borders are going to be flooded with Chinese goods, whether we like it or not. So, you know, it's there to haunt us, so we have to create some kind of a response. And the enlightened, the more enlightened it is, the better, because it's the underground who can easily pass through different countries and do whatever they feel like. Politicians do the same. It's only the civil society or people like us who are stopped with the visa regime. So we have to rethink these regimes and develop some kind of a response of our own. Thank you very much. And here are some books from Calcutta Research Group. May I now request Modhurun, Dr. Modhuruna Choudhury to come and offer the formal vote of thanks.
Nath to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. I, on behalf of the Department of South and Southeast Asia Studies, University of Calcutta, extend a very hearty vote of thanks to Professor C. Raja Mohan for gracing your important work and sharing with us your findings and opinions today. I also thank Mohanirvan Calcutta uh, Research Group and uh, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung for collaborating with us. I express our sincere thanks to Professor Hari Vasudevan. We would also like to express our sincere thanks to the Center for Social Sciences, student participants and our colleagues from our and other departments. Thank you all and enjoy the evening.